The Eternal High Priest. Hello, I'm Kendall Bryan Hunter, author of the book Consider My Servant Job, and this is Come Follow Me, Get to the Point, where I always show up, I always come prepared, we never take roll, and just bring your own refreshments. Water. Ah, that is the best refreshment. One calorie, crystal clear. Ooh, I got a little spot on there. Let's watch how long you see it takes to evaporate. <clears throat> so I am Kendall Bryan Hunter, author of this book, Consider My Servant Job. Black Friday is coming up. It makes a great gift. Get ready for the Old Testament in a couple of years. On all the uh, normal book outlets, uh, Google Books, Amazon, Cedar Ford is my publisher. Talk to them. They have a great selection of books. I also do uh, review some books for Cedar Fort too. So, why well, that spot's getting really big right now. That's going to be a distraction. So, I've allowed Ty. That'll be an even, and <clears throat> that'll be an even bigger distraction. So, some housekeeping stuff. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for all the new subscribers. Got me over 100. If I did not read your name, put it in the comments below, and I'll get to it with the uh, next broadcast. Um, update on the hospital. I work at a hospital, and a couple of weeks ago, there was a fire at the hospital. So things are going good. They've got all the fans out, and they're just replacing a lot of the uh, sheetrock in there. Still messy and dusty, and it's disruptive, but uh, doing the best they can. The, the, the fire was in the maternity ward. There was one of these uh, plug strips that overheated, and hospitals are very good about putting out fires. The problem is just with all the water, the water damage. So uh, we're dealing with the water damage and replacing it, so... That's good. Uh, anything else? I can't think of anything else. So today's lesson is going to be th out of order. So I hope it doesn't confuse you. So we're going to start with Hebrews 11. And that is the Bible's Hall of Fame, where it lists all these great people from the past and how they exercise faith. Parallel chapters in Ether chapter uh, 12. It's in the Book of Mormon, where they list that. It's uh, You're feeling a little down on your faith. Read these and Paul talks about the heroes of the faith. The, the Hall of Fame is President Thomas S. Monson's uh, term for that, and he has a talk on it from the uh, October 1974 conference. And I have the links in the note link below in the notes section. And good to re review it uh, about the faithful people, the men and women of the past who exercised faith and how they dealt with life's challenges. So going to the most of the second half of the book of Hebrews is a continuation of the first, where Paul's taking Old Testament experiences, showing how they prefigured or symbolized Christ, and then trying to show the superiority of Christ's mission over the law of Moses and what happened with the ancient patriarchs. And so it's a little bit, it's more of the same. It may feel repetitive, and I will grant that. But it goes into some details that we're not quite familiar with uh, coming from the background, but the people in and the New Testament would have been familiar with the symbols he is alluding to, specifically the converted Jews, as opposed to the proselytes. So here, here, here's some of the figures and symbols. Uh, you have Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. He's the eternal high priest. And remember this, he's from the tribe of Judah. You have Melchizedek. He's also the ancient high priest. He doesn't have a tribe because he was contemporary with Abraham. So it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then with Jacob, you have the 12 tribes. So he's before uh, he had the 12 tribes come into play. So he does not, doesn't have a tribe. He's not a Jew in the narrow technical sense, but he certainly is uh, comes from that Abrahamic faith uh, connection. So he's interesting. He's a high priest over the city of Salem, both king and priest. No separation, church and state. He took tithing from Abraham. So you think about that. We, we normally think of Abraham as being the prophet in his day and as a presiding authority and he wasn't. Uh, Melchizedek was. Um, he uh, gave tithing to Melchizedek, and Mel uh, Melchizedek ordained Abraham to be a high priest. And Melchizedek, his symbol is that he's symbolic of the Melchizedek priesthood, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So uh, Alma 13, where he talks about Melchizedek being a king of Salem, and also there's an interesting passage in the Joseph Smith translation, chapter 14, uh, starting with verse 25, and it's in the back. Melchizedek was a child prodigy. He had all this faith when he was very young, and uh, he did some incredible stuff that you can read about. Uh, and you understand why we call the Melchizedek priesthood after him. Now, another thing to keep in mind with the Melchizedek priesthood is that all other authorities or offices in the church are appendages to the Melchizedek priesthood. That's uh, section 107, verse 5. So when we're talking about the three orders of the priesthood, the Melchizedek, 
the patriarchal, and then the Levitical or the Aaronic priesthood. Everything's derivative of the Melchizedek priesthood. So Christ, Melchizedek, now we're going to Abraham. Abraham is the father of the faithful. Like Melchizedek, he didn't have a tribe. He's one who paid tithes to Melchizedek. And he's associated with the covenant of marriage. That's his dispensation is mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants section 110, verse 12 at the Kirtland Temple. You have this person named Elias from his dispensation. We have no idea who he is. Uh, this Elias could be Melchizedek, could have been Abraham himself. You understand that Elias is a title of a forerunner. And I get to devote an entire podcast talking about uh, what Elias means to the Latter-day Saints. So Abraham is symbolic of the patriarchal order of the patriarchal priesthood. What's that? Well, this is something that uh, you read about in the Doctrine and Covenants in section 131, verse 2. Read it very carefully. It talks about that marriage is an order of the priesthood. We normally think of the Melchizedek priesthood and the Aaronic priesthood, but there's the matrimonial order of the priesthood. Uh, with some of the updates in the endowment, it alludes to this understanding of the uh, patriarchal order of the priesthood. You can also read about in teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith, pages 38 to 40, and also pages, really dig deep on this one, pages 322 and 323, where Joseph Smith says, yeah, there's three orders of the priesthood. You know, we think, said, we think of Melchizedek and uh, the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, but there's the uh, Abrahamic order, the patriarchal order. And this is a quote from President Packer. He talked a little bit about this. And I have a link below. He published an article. This is some regional representative training. So February 1993, there's a link below where he talks about uh, this order of the priesthood. And this is what he said. The patriarchal order is not a third separate priesthood. Whatever relates to the patriarchal order is embraced in the Melchizedek priesthood. The patriarchal order is a part of the Melchizedek priesthood, which enables endowed and worthy men to preside over their posterity in time and eternity. There's a specific aspect of the, um, of the priesthood, specifically for families. This starts tugging into another thread, is that sometimes with, uh, this is home teaching, and uh, you can sort of back off with ministering, but uh, if a person was in trouble, you know, send to the home teachers. Well, no, you start with the family first. If, if, if the person has family close by, they give the blessings, and the home teachers are the secondary things. It's home-centered church, patriarchal order, then Melchizedek priesthood order. Home-centered church, um, home-centered and church-supported. You, you focus on the family, and then you have the uh, church steps in second. And we're, we're getting closer to the way things should be, uh, closer to how things operate in heaven. So Jesus Christ, he's the point of all this. You have um, Melchizedek, Melchizedek priesthood, Abraham, the patriarchal order. Then you have Levi, the Levitical order, or the Aaronic priesthood. And those are the has a priest function in the times of Moses, from Moses to the time of Jesus Christ. That's how things function with the Levitical priesthood. Levi, of course, was from the tribe of Levi. He was the head. Uh, Moses uh, was a Levite, and also Aaron were also Levites. And uh, Levi was, uh, it's kind of interesting because, you know, the ancient Levites received tithes, but also, um, this gets a little, we're going to talk the symbol, the symbol a little bit later. Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek and that he was in Abraham's loins, if you understand that symbol. So another person is Moses. Moses is the tribe of Levi, and he is the great prophet. We associate, even though he was a Levite, he held the Melchizedek priesthood and held the keys of his dispensation about the gathering of Israel. That's back to the Kirtland Temple again. Uh, another thing to think about is the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a portable temple, and it was done after the Aaronic order. So they didn't do things the way we do them now. They do sacrifices. And they, they may have been able... My suspicion is they're able to perform the temple endowment or some version of it like we do do now, but the main part was to do these uh, animal sacrifices that you read about the Old Testament, and I bet you found them they're very boring. They can be tedious, but they're important to understand. And so you have people like me who study history, and we like we can slug through and we enjoy reading it, and you know, uh, some people don't find them interesting, I do. Although I think it's funny, people, oh, this Old Testament's boring, but they'll sit there gobble up fantasy novels and Kind of the same thing. So you have the tabernacle, and it had a <clears throat> you had an outer courtyard. You had an inner place called the holy place, and you had the, the uh, cubicle area called the holy of holies, where the ark of the covenant was. And if you've seen, they've had this mobile tabernacle go around Utah for a couple of years now. So if you get a chance to see it, it's uh, worth the trip. It gives you a feel. It's it's a life size replica of it. And it gives you a feel of what the uh, temple was like, or, or the tabernacle was. So, 
Hebrew chapters 9, 10, and 12, um, what it does, it compares the sacrifices of Moses with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. How you have all the sacrifices and you have Christ's ultimate sacrifice that exalted everyone. You understand the contrast between an animal sacrifice and Jesus Christ's sacrifice. It, it talked about that in the Book of Mormon, Alma 3410, that an animal cannot atone for humans. It cannot atone for sin. To atone for a person's sin or the sins of all humanity, you need to have an infinite and eternal sacrifice, and that's what Christ was. So these symbols were prefigures of what Christ did in the same way that when we take the sacrament, it's symbolic of Christ's um, body and his blood, and it gets us thinking about Jesus Christ, the same way with the animal sacrifices. So Paul's point is that these uh, Old Testament symbols prefigured Christ. If we were paying attention, you could understand them. You'd understand what Christ's mission was about. So that's Moses in the tabernacle. So we're getting into the meteor area, and wow, I'm at 11 minutes already. So Hebrews 7, verse 10. Now, Paul talks about Melchizedek. There's Joseph Smith translations on it. Now, the one thing that Paul makes the point is that Melchizedek was not have a tribe. He held the Melchizedek priesthood, which is not based on lineage, whereas the Aaronic priesthood is. You have to be a Levite to hold it, whereas the Melchizedek priesthood, anyone can hold it. And Melchizedek, like you said, held the superior priesthood, but you don't, you don't get caught up with the with the lineage or the affiliation with the with the tribes. And Abraham came to Moses, or to uh, Abraham came to Melchizedek and was blessed of him. And Abraham also paid tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek uh, ordained him to the office of high priest. So what the, what the symbols are is that you have Melchizedek represents Christ or the Melchizedek priesthood because he was a king of Salem. Then Abraham has two things. You have Abraham himself, the patriarchal order of the priesthood but also Levi, because Levi hadn't been born yet, so he was in Abraham's loins, if you understand the symbol. He was going to be, be that. And so this is the symbol that Paul is talking about, is you have Melchizedek and Abraham. And see, Melchizedek was a greater person than Abraham because uh, the lesser person gets blessed by the greater. Melchizedek held the Melchizedek priesthood, whereas um, Abraham didn't, and he got blessed by him. And that's really what the point of the illustration is, but it also illustrates these three orders of the priesthood, Melchizedek, the patriarchal, and the Levitical. And that's how they interact. If you understand the symbol, you understand the reality behind the symbol. Now, the other thing to keep in mind with this is that Christ is greater than Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. And so that's the top of it. So Levi, Abraham, they have Melchizedek, then you have Christ on top of it. Okay, that's what the book's all about. It's just illustrating how important Christ is. It's really simple, but we're just not familiar with the symbols in the same way that if you were to travel back to Joseph Smith's day and use some allusions from uh, Star Wars or the Avengers movie or Harry Potter, people wouldn't catch them. You know, we even have trouble understanding Shakespeare sometimes, and Shakespeare is fairly close to us. So that's the book of Hebrews. So, except I didn't talk about Hebrew th chapter 13. That's the wind-down one, some, which is familiar with the rest of Paul's epistles. It begins different, but it ends familiar, where Paul just gives specific counsel to people. That's it. We're at 13 minutes, so let's, let me get to the Christ quotient. I always end with the Christ quotient, tying this back to Jesus Christ, so there's just no, no confusion about what we're doing who the center of all this is, Jesus Christ. And we're grateful for Joseph Smith to be a revealer of Christ, to reveal these things about Melchizedek. So first of all, who's in your spiritual hall of fame? I've sat through uh, testimony meetings and talks where people talk about secular leaders, Tiger Woods, Bill Gates, people teaching from a book from the Harvard Business Review, book review, not from the scriptures. Yeah, a little... little You'll be blessed if you turn to the scriptures and you, and you use the scripture heroes instead of uh, focusing on worldly heroes. Uh, Scarlet Pimpernel, the Three Musketeers, Obi Wan Kenobi, really, really good with sword fighting. Doesn't compare anything to Ammon. And there's more lessons to uh, you can gain from Ammon than you can from these uh, fictitious people. Um, secondly, are you able to read the Old Testament as a prefigure of Christ, like? A lot of the cultural stuff is lost on us, and so it has a loosening effect. But it made it was a lot more relevant to the Nephites as they were uh, <clears throat> had whatever version of the law of Moses they practiced, what exactly they practiced, how the sacrifices were. We don't understand. We know something was going on, and Abinadi talks about this. But us, it's a little bit lost on us. So uh, talk with your Jewish friends, uh, 
Hanukkah's coming up and good time to dialogue with your Jewish friends. So lastly, I'd like to deliver a message to my fellow high priest. That's uh, my ordained office. I'm like Paul was a uh, an apostle born out of time, and I feel like I'm a high priest born out of the time I was ordained when I was in my mid 40s. I know people who are ordained in their 20s. Uh, the, the character I play on my some on uh, some of my other videos, uh, Sherwin Nutt, you, you, that's me making fun of that. People who just get ordained high priests and get called to the high council and. They just get ordained high priests for the most of their adult life, whereas people like me is like, yeah, we spent decades in the elders' quorum, and it has an interesting effect upon you. But I'm going to talk to the high priest now. For high priest, are you honoring your foreordination, or are you betraying your pre-mortal self? Are you being serious about the oath and covenant of the priesthood and the specific things a high priest needs to be doing, or, or are you betraying your pre-mortal self? Uh, are you doing things like reading the church lessons beforehand? Are you th or do you think, well, I'm a high priest, I got it made? Or, are you really studying? Or are you holding yourself to a lower standard? Are you becoming an informed and an expert on gospel principles? Um, when you take the sacrament, are you focusing on the covenant or on the outward mechanical expression that is putting food in your mouth, feeding a baby, bread, water? I'm all set. If you re read a... I think it's uh, Elder Renlund has a footnote about this, where just showing up to church and eating the sacrament. Now, you, you have to do a little bit more with that. There's more involved with that. Uh, this whole thing of getting warm bodies in a room, putting food in their mouth. No, you're making a covenant to change your behavior and change the way you think. Also, high priest, are you using the correct name of the church, emphasizing Jesus Christ, or are you a slave to historical error? Okay, it's time to get with the program. It took us a while to get into tithing. It took us a while to get into the Word of Wisdom. It took us a while to get into the Book of Mormon. I was in high school before we started taking the Book of Mormon seriously. Now it's time to start using the correct name of the church. That's the big barrier. That's that's the bar a stumbling block to Zion is uh, not using the correct name of the church. Reading a revelation and rationalizing why you don't need to follow the revelation. So that's some counsel. To, I have to my fellow high priest, when you think about Melchizedek, you know, at 17 minutes, so, and this is get to the point, I'm supposed to be quick. So this is, this, lastly, this is our farewell to Paul. This is the last letter of Paul's that we studied. Now, he crops up in one of Peter's epistles as a kind of a snarky comment, but we finished Paul. So how has Paul's testimony transformed you? One verse, has one verse made a difference to you? Not the whole thing. And are you being transformed? Are you becoming more Christ-like? Because being more Christ-like, that's the point.